Dear colleagues, through this two days of the conference, one of the concerns expressed was how are we going to understand and explain the April-May events in Armenia. Hopefully this presentation will somehow help you to answer that important question. Before I get down to the text per se, this is more a result of something, the compilation in translation of the feminist uh, papers of the 80s and discussions that unfolded there The questions and solutions uh, set forth here shall evolve around provisions that had either been criticized or are not used like before. And But understanding that, I still find it expedient to rely on this pre-science and provisions, hoping that they will shed some light on the subject. This is rather focusing on some possible solutions. It would be appropriate to first formulate the scope of issues which will pave the way for properly raising the subject, which are, is it at all possible on the basis of the so-called Western experience to compile theories, principles, and methods, could they also apply when studying non-Western experiences? If yes, how shall these be applied? Is, it, is there an essential need to develop strategies for their application, considering the fundamental Westernist and di non-Western divide? These issues are not new. They became more salient in the colonial, post-colonial, non-Western societies, where in various academic circles, uh, in both Western and non-Western, they tried to make this a subject of study. Moreover, the first question posed here greatly determined the sciences on history, culture, and uh, humanities. The social sciences should have been studied mostly and predominantly by Western societies embarking on the mod age of modernity and the humanities and especially anthropology uh, by the non-Westerns who still had not embarked on that stage. These issues became more salient and expedient in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union when Western research models penetrating the post-Soviet societies, including relevant institutions in Armenia. It should be mentioned that I'm not talking at all about the models uh, based on Western experience not being used in Soviet institutions before. Of course, the social sciences and humanities in the Soviet contexts were based on Western practices, but they were very limited uh, Western theories, ideas, and hypotheses in circulation. Some of them were even prohibited in the Soviet context, and the Soviet sociological thought was underdeveloped in general. The Soviet didn't have a full-fledged study of its own society. It didn't have adequate empirical, neither theoretical toolkits to study it. That which the post-Soviet social realities entailed to be studied, there was a certain dis divide between the available toolkit and the object to be studied, which had to result in statements of impossibilities to study it. This divide, this schism, intermittently became apparent in the continually unfolding changes concurrent thereto. I'm talking in particular also about the Armenian events that were qualified as a Velvet Revolution. Uh, 
So one has to had to decide how to deal, after all, with the Armenian social reality from research perspective. So for a local researcher, first and foremost, it became essential to uh, acquire cognizance of this divide and try to find a way out from it if this divide was inevitable and the local academic practice were to be deemed immature and yet not fertile, what could have been the possible solutions if these issues were not at all new for the non-Western societies? Could their experiences propose certain strategies in given context? These two questions may be answered positively by identifying two such strategies which were inspired by post-constructivist schools. The first strategy, if it was efficiently applied by the Chakravarti Scribat in his thoughts on the sacrifice of the widow. Although Spivak never names it, I would propose to name it at least causification of certain actual references. The second strategy was more inspired by Paul Gidrow's liberation from Western slavery and could be qualified as a selective application of this instrument. The post-colonial feminist cultural studies have made it already classical, made a subordinate speak thoughts on the sacrifice of the widow was written in the 80s of the last century. The focus of the ideas of the author is the right of the of burning the widow fire. He brings forth two contrasting but mutually legitimizing approaches, the British imperial and the Indian native. But this, the remarkable part in this essay is not only the entire, not the idea of uh, shedding light on the ritual of silencing the widow, but the approach he adopts. The essay is written in a critical spirit, which sometimes even turns into sarcasm, but it's also permeated by pointed self-criticism. So a question arises, what makes the author throughout the essay to maintain this self-critical spirit? One of the decisive circumstances, I believe, is the existing cultural, political, radical difference between the subject studied and the researcher, which is increasing the possibility of unreliability of acquired knowledge, therefore puts a big question on the expediency and the appropriateness of doing such a research within the confines of the Western thought. On the other hand, one has also to accept that by the end of the day, in the academic discourse, there are no practices that would be alternative to Western ones. In this case, you could have highlighted the silence of a sub subjective wo woman, whereas he wants first and foremost to give her a voice. Because in no previous uh, attempt, I'm talking 70s and 80s, uh, of uh, Indian history, the voice of this subject woman was never heard. So he has adopted Western practices, applying, like he says, the first world, uh, Freud, Foucault, and Lyotard, and others, male-dominated uh, viewpoints, but emphasizing all the time that in referencing to the Freud's lecture, this is being done only conventionally. So in the, uh, in the mind of Spivak, there is already the predisposition to discuss the local reality in the light of, and in, with references to Western practices. In other words, in applying these theories and references, the Spivak applies or adopts a strategy which may be conventionally called causification. So these theories and references to some extent lose their accuracy and reliability, which is eroded, and this characteristic about erosion of accuracy and uh, reliability is more characterized from a Western viewpoint or perspective. Instead, 
uh, suddenly there is a better outline and more salient we see features that would have been unnoticed otherwise so you can objectify the here to four unobjectifiable structures relations and uh, alia so even through by paying the price of classification of uh, references within the framework of Western practices, it is becoming possible to study the non-Western realities. In general terms, Martin Heitinger's ideology impact is felt here, which constructivist thinkers like uh, Joseph Butler and Ernesto Lachnaldo had their teachings have been significantly affected by this. In the event of the latter, the causification uh, is just one of the orientations uh, that give birth to thought. Does this causification in its turn become inevitable? And like, and how could it be explained at all? I think this is also an important question or this series of questions. In the first case, the answer is also positive, determined by the fact that theories and references uh, upon being transferred from one cultural context to another, contexts that are especially at a significant distance from each other, is nothing else but an act of translation. And as it is common knowledge, no translation can ever be ideally reproducing or transposing the work into a different cultural context, it uh, inevitably transforms, as like Benjamin would say, Walter Benjamin, the original survives, continues to live, and uh, relive in an other language. So the causification of references is not only inevitable, but is absolutely not to be feared in the academic sense. Moreover, it is fruitful, especially in the context of Western practices, as a way to renovation, innovation, and transgressing the confines. Especially Judith Butler from Among the Constructivism realizes this. Who, and one can draw this conclusion from her thoughts about translation practices. I will now apply both approaches specifically to the Armenian realities like I attempted to do. As I mentioned, it's first and foremost inspired by Paul Gilroy's uh, The Black Experience of Shedding Slavery and may be used the selective application of Western research methods. Famous literary critic, uh, post-colonial uh, thinker Paul Gilroy in his Black Atlantis and uh, famous work examines a culture, like he calls it the Black Atlantis, which transgresses ethnicity or nation and includes African, American, Caribbean or British cultural elements. At the same time, juxtaposing the holistic approach of portraying the reality as a monolith, he adopts an opposing ap approach, uh, taking it as a reality replete with internal diversity. Paul Gilroy says that from slavery to uh, the ideology of Western uh, approaches to liberation from s slavery is applied selectively. It should not be looked at as something absolutely outside of Western uh, modernity, but it could be viewed even within the Western modernity, which puts the relations between the West and the slave. So within the, within the operating within the framework of Western practices, often that which the researcher does or can do in the event of the non-Western experience is nothing else but the selective application of Western approaches and theories in addressing a local issue and resolving it. Sometimes it is necessary to combine various components from these theories, letting go of some other components thereof. So thus, the above-mentioned two strategies 
are charting an interesting relationship between the Western and non-Western, the exogenous and the internal, the general and the specific. For example, if we take the liberty of uh, making a vulnerable assumption which is in circulation, which uh, looks on the one uh, at the Western, exogenous and general, on the other side, the non-Western, internal and specific. This especially pertains to the position, means and results of a study and the reliability of the findings. It would be appropriate now to reflect on the two strategies of causification of references and selective application. As is common knowledge in the public discourse, in the Armenian public discourse, there is a widely circulated idea, among others, the idea and the notion of historical injustice. So we had to find the means of research which would allow us to look at the Armenian discourse reality and the role and place of this idea in that reality. As such, I have selected a post-Marxist uh, study with its tradition in the post-constructive uh, Nesto Laglau and Chantal Muff works. In this study, the actual uh, references are the point of note, and the Laglau and Jezek have borrowed it from Jean Lacan and enriched it through their approach. And the idea of hegemony was uh, taken from Antonio Gramsci. In a nutshell, in this theory, the framework of uh, this course in its meanings is not enshrined essentially, therefore there are floating denominators. But that which concurrently describes the framework is the surplus of uh, meanings. The When the hegemony is affirmed in, in this course w through its point of application or nodes, where they are temporarily and partially enshrined in the elements of the floating denominators of that framework, thus acquiring a regulatory role. So if the notion historical injustice is perceived as a, such a node, you clearly outline the hegemony that is characteristic of Armenian reality, the new liberalism and conservatism in certain combination thereof, but the issue was that in the Armenian reality it would be difficult to describe it as a reality endowed with the surplus of meanings, which is still preserved and salient in the most recent events which were described as Velvet Revolution. On the other hand, denying any ideological or ideographic alternatives in the Armenian reality would also be impossible. So here's the dilemma, either let go of this theory which allows to describe this reality or at least apply such, uh, a, a just any strategy in uh, theoretical discourse, if this post-Marxist theories, both actual hegemony and node notions were to be quasified, that is applied with uh, reservations, that is uh, conventionally, reducing the degree of their accuracy to some extent, every condition to their application seems to exist. On the one hand, it would be possible to work within the four corners of Western practices. On the other hand, acquire knowledge that would characterize the Armenian reality, but the reliability margin on the accuracy of this through self-criticism may be maintained to a certain degree. The, the events that were called Armenian uh, well, but the revolution could also be studied, did lend themselves to study under the angle of this theory. If the famous motto, take a step and uh, turn down search, could be qualified as a partial denominator and contains within all other uh, popular demands, like increased wages, for example, or fight against corruption then it's also understandable why it was possible to have such a radical uh, break.
but the, in the event of the lack or scarcity of ideolo ideological no, nominators, such a hegemonic uh, notion applies with certain reservations. Now let's reflect on the second s application of this strategy. As for the second strategy, the example will be shorter because in reality a separate communication uh, keynote would be required for that. I, this could be called liberation, but not yet a full revolution in the meaning of r and theory. Focusing on issues of social justice, uh, which is John Ross's theory, and post -mar in the post-Marxist uh, sense, this could be deemed as a... And for the whole theory, uh, the pivotal well-regulated society is a notion that in this, res in this case, I believe, the, it does not apply. Of course, one of the main questions is, what transpires when a researcher applies always, uh, often divergent uh, theories and studies from modernist to postmodernist, from conventional uh, to post-Marxist? The answer is in the spirit of post-constructivism. In this reality, everything resembles ethical, political decision-making.